Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Kingdom Conversations with me, Lunzing Lee. <laughs> I want to say it differently today. We're going to pick up uh, this afternoon on a conversation that we began a week ago with Apostle Robin Beach. And what we were talking about is the fast and it's a fascinating conversation about origins. Do you know where you come from? Do you know, you know, uh, really what in the beginnings were not so for your life right now. Those are just some of the fascinating aspects to understanding what the Christ is saying to us when he lets us know that the original intent of the Father is far greater than we have given the Father credit for. So all the way from Prairie Grove, Arkansas, I want to welcome a man of God that I esteem, that I love dearly. He is my bratty baby brother, but he is my big brother, Apostle Robin Beach. Come on in, bro. <laughs> hey, hey, how y'all hey. doing? <laughs> I am so glad that you are here today. And because I know how conversations get going, last week when we talked and we said we would make it available, you had mentioned something that you were talking about, the incarnation, the blueprint of creation. And I happen to have my copy here and I wanted to let our guests know, and this is what you said, that if anybody is interested in having a copy, a digital copy of this, he does not sell this, but he does receive donations for it. And so if you are friends with Apostle Robin on Facebook Messenger, you can simply message him and tell him that you're interested in the incarnation, the blueprint of creation, or you could just say his, his notes, and uh, he will respond to you directly. We will also make sure that we post that in the notes at some point here in the comments for the program so that you're able to do that. And you know, I was thinking about this because when I first saw this, Robin, and I, and I want to talk to you about it, but when I first saw these notes, I kept, I, you know, I reached out to you, is everything spelled properly? Because I want to make sure that we get all these things done right. And we want, you know, because this is part of your book at some point. And we also, you know, your sister, our sister, Jennifer Foster, Apostle Jennifer Foster, she also had some comments about that. I'll let her speak for herself, though. Hi, <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> you remember when we saw this? Didn't you have some comments about the cover? And some yes, so we want to make it pretty. Go ahead. Yes, yes. The one thing that the Lord uh, kept showing me um, about creation and about our origins is that we are the dream and the Father's heart that He breathed life into. And so many times we have dreams within our own hearts, but the father had the ability to breathe life into that dream and give us the body and give us a story that we are living out today. So when we even talk about history in general, we're not talking about history. We're talking about his story about humanity and about us. So that debunks the whole you were just an accident. No, you weren't. You were a dream that originated in his heart. So, yes. I, I think I don't even know if Jennifer knows this or not, but I'm going to add something to that. In uh, James chapter one, verse 18, he said that we were birthed. We were birthed from the desire of God by the word of truth. That word there, desire, Jennifer, is the Greek word bulomai. And do you know what that word literally means? Mm, dream. It, if it's broke down, it means love dream. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it literally means love dream. I love it. The beautiful yeah. intention, the love dream of God. Yes. So you're absolutely right. I like that. So what else? So as we talk about this, what was it you, when you <coughs> wrote this? And you've got some other books that are coming up. And that's why I kind of think this is fun because it's Sisters and Brother having a conversation, but I'm honored because I'm talking to two apostles that I, I highly respect. Amen. So I'm getting to glean from each of you, you know, the things that, that you have to say, but you know, you have, you, when you speak apostle Robin, there is such a beautiful poetry and a rhythm and a cadence to your words. And that's one of the things we were talking. I was, we were talking about last week when I said you came out of rock and roll, you could not deal with the staid of, uh, stale version of of, of churchology um, because because you have a whole different rhythm 
pattern that you are attuned to. And so as we talk about the books that are in you, do you want to share a little bit about the origin or the story? Because this is part two of origins, but, um, you know, getting these books out, uh, the things that the father is giving you dreams about and talking. Jennifer, just feel free. Y'all y'all have the conversation and I'm going to sit here and grin. <laughs> I, uh, you know, Lonzine, one of the things that when I was putting this together, when I was putting even this primer together, and I call it a primer, and, and what I was uh, talking to, Actually, there were several ladies. It was kind of a fascinating situation, but there were several ladies sitting around the other night at the Convergence mm -hmm. and uh, afterward that were just kind of sitting around and we were talking and, and they were asking me questions kind of like what you had just posed to me. And I said, well, you have to understand, ladies, that this this primer is not what God gave me as far as just the topic of the incarnation. Mm -hmm. It's not a topical primer. This is literally what the Lord has shown me on how I read the word. Starting at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and going through Revelation 22, 21. So the three different parts of this primer is a lens that the Lord revealed to me on how to see the entirety of Scripture. It's the, it's the, it's the lens, like to use your word that you used uh, last week that that lens of my vision it's it's the glasses that I put on if I will that I that I that are his eyes that belong to him that I look through because he told me from the very beginning that you're not going to be like everybody else I didn't create you to be I created you to be unique and I created you to be who you are and and I, I've in my lifetime I have always found that the greatest times of, of hardship that I've gone through is when I have strayed away from that, <laughs> from who he simply created me to be. And so now that I've gotten older, I've learned that, that the, the most accurate thing that I can do in the most accurate way that I can present the Father and the Father's heart to humanity is simply being the revelation of him in me. That's, 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 that's all, that's all that I know. And that's why I tell people now, I've got to the point in my life now, sissies, that, I can, that I'm not scared to tell people, read me. If you can't get the word, read me. Look at me. Just look at me. Read me. And then we'll go from there. <laughs> go ahead, Jennifer. What do you think? He said, he, I remember you saying that in Kona. <laughs> read me and dude that was like mic drop all the way go ahead yes, <laughs> yes. and and i and i agree uh 100 uh with robin you know that many times when we see something um and we are not quite comfortable in our own identity because we don't understand fully how much we are already loved even in the midst of our process even in the midst of our darkness that we tend to look for other people to tell us what is the right pattern when we should be looking unto him. And as we gaze on his beauty, then he transforms us into the likeness. But so often we are encouraged to look at a man, to look at a mantle, to look at this guy, that guy, a movement. And then we get our eyes off of the original pattern sun. And then we wonder why we're confused. We wonder why we're unhappy. We wonder why we feel unfulfilled and our identity is not right and we're always you know focusing on our flaws is because we have taken our eyes off of him and we have put them on ourselves and we have tried to literally patch ourselves up by our own works you know but uh ephesians 2 9 uh tells us that it's not by work so that no one can boast for we are god's workmanship created in christ jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance. So all these things have already been prepared. We don't have to run after things to validate us. Our validation doesn't even come from doing the things for him. The things that we do for him are kind of like, how do I say it? It's kind of like when you go out on a date with your spouse, the date with your spouse it's not the main thing that's important. The important thing is that you get to spend time with your spouse. 
it doesn't matter what you're doing or where you're going, but the being with the spouse is what makes it worth the while, not what you get to do while you get there. And I think if we can get back to that mentality of it's not what I'm doing with Jesus, it's the being with Jesus that will make the journey of whatever we're doing with Jesus more fulfilling if we just simply get our identity from him. I like that. You know what? I, I think it's so interesting because we're used to saying, using the, even the expression of the pattern son. But I think that for a lot of people coming into things, they don't understand that a pattern is something that is to be followed, not mm. something that is to be modified. It isn't mm. something that we're supposed to tailor to our own liking. Well, I bought this pattern, but I don't really like the out, the image that I see. Instead, I'm going to just use the pattern as something to be a, a, as, a, because I needed a pattern. So any pattern will do because I'm going to create my own original design. And isn't that silly that we want to create an original design when we already are an original design. So possibly you know, a, fasc a fascinating yeah. thing that you just said, and that both, uh, both of you have said in different ways, and I'm going to re recapture <laughs> a, a scripture that Jennifer just used. Okay. And it's this, that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, mm -hmm. right? We were right. created in Christ Jesus for good works. <laughs> what are those good works? Exactly. What are those good works? Uh, how do we define what good works are? Mm -hmm. Okay, now watch this. So part of the issue with the identity and what happened in the garden with the loss of that identity was when Adam and Eve were deceived to believe that the provision that they had been given by God was not good enough for them, that he had withheld Something for him. We know even the psalmist wrote, for he withholds no good thing. Mm -hmm. But they had believed that God had withheld something from him. So they entered into their own works to provide for themselves what they believed God had not provided for them. But in that, they entered into a system called good and evil. Mm. Now, a fascinating thing about that word good and evil, those words truly mean worthwhile or valuable and worthless. That's what they mean. We always think of good and evil as, well, my behavior is good or my behavior is bad. Or this was a good action or this was a evil, bad action. Mm -hmm. But literally that word evil, if you can look it up in the Septuagint, which was finished in 132 B.C., it was written by 70 different Jewish scholars and translated into the Greek. That word that they use there for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that word evil there is poneris. Yes. That word poneris, do you know what that word is translated as? I thought it was sin, but what is it? It is translated as sin, but you know what it is farther than that? No. <laughs> Tell us. Hardship, toil, and annoyance. Wow. So God defines evil, and the fruit of that tree is us entering on our own labor and toiling with full of hardships and annoyances, trying to receive that for ourselves that he has already provided for us. So from the beginning... We were simply meant to be provided for, and we were simply meant to be gatherers. Adam was not called to cultivate until after he left the garden. He was simply a gatherer. He was a gatherer, that which had been provided for him. And the good works that we have now today to walk in is simply to recognize and discover the full riches of his provision and to walk and to live in that and by that and not by our own acts of self-righteousness, self-identity or self-worth. So then what you just said is that the word rest is actually to, let me use it, is to gather, to settle. I mean, what you just described is what God, to cease from your own labor and to rest in God is to gather and to receive and to 
what was the last part? Because I was so, my brain went quick. Um, he was to gather. He is to well. I'm going to just put it this way: to gather and to be satisfied by the pleasure of God. Absolutely. Okay. So, huh. Lonzine, did you know that the word glory in and of itself is called doxa? Yes. That's the word doxa, right? Do you know what doxa means in its base form? When I have a conversation with you, the answer is no. I do not know. <laughs> that word glory, believe it or not, in its base form simply means opinion. What? Opinion. The glory of God is simply the opinion of God. And we live now by the glory of God, which is God's opinion or God's truth. It's God's opinion that births faith within us. So the faith that we now live by, we were crucified with Christ and the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So the faith that we live in, faith brings glory. And that glory is simply living in the opinion that God, what God's knowledge of us, what he knows about to be true about us and not what we believe to be true about ourselves. I like it. I, there's a, this is, y'all are just going to have to, we're going to have to, I can already tell you, we don't have enough time and we're going to have to further this one out because this has to be explored some more. You, you, I, I, my um, wonder twin there, I know we can go along the same line. So I'm going to, I'm going to yield to you, sis. <laughs> you know, as, as, um, as Robin is sharing, what the Lord brought to my remembrance is how often do we try to add to the works and we try to add extra glory to whatever he asked us to do. In the First Samuel uh, 15, uh, 13 through 15, it's talking about how, um, well, I'm just going to read it. It says, when Samuel reached him, Saul said to him, may the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instruction. But Samuel replied, then what is this bleeding of sheep and lowing of cow that I hear? Yeah. The troops brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best sheep and cattle to sacrifice. Here it is to the Lord, your God. Yeah. So when we get into those works, he becomes the Lord, your God, instead of the Lord, my God. And I'm looking for ways to appease him because relationship with him no longer satisfies me. I need to add to it in order for me to feel like there is something that I'm doing of significance because whatever he has to say is no longer enough in my book. And that's the seed of rebellion there. That's, that's a type of backsliding. Yes. That yes. actual scripture is the one that was used, that passage. When Samuel, I mean, when Saul said, I did obey and the Lord is looking at or, or Samuel's looking at him like, no, you didn't. That was the verse that the Lord used to reveal to me the type of rebellion and stubbornness that I walked in. I didn't realize uh, this just thing. It's like you know, talking about the entrance of his word bringing light. I did not realize that I had the <coughs> form of obedience and that I, you know, like that horrible expression good enough for gospel this is this this standard it's not god's standard but it's good enough for what he wants to do as though everything outside of him is supposed to excel but his stuff can be mediocre and my form of obedience disobedience rebellion and stubbornness i was walking in in a witchcraft in a deception because i did not realize that uh and what you just said um Robin, about the glory, the opinion of God, I was living as though my opinion mattered as much as God's, or even more so, since <laughs> after all, from that thinking that I had, it was my life. So why wouldn't my opinion precede his? Uh, we, we know the answer to that because that comes under the heading of sheer stupidity. I want to go back to something real quick. And that is just the very opening of your orientation of origin. And then your intro, the, I love when stuff starts with a question. And you start with what is the secret that empowers the individual to live beyond the confines of the frustrating restrictions of an earth-tethered, dwarfed existence? And then you ask another question, like anybody can answer that. Um, what will release us? to live beyond disappointment and free us from anxiety, the fear of failure, and ultimately the fear of death. 
I'm going to shorten it and say, and then let you expound. But to me, it sounds like if I live according to the opinion of God, then these things are going to be solved. But what say you, brother dear? Well, there, there, there was a, a, an interesting way that I came about this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I know, uh, and I ask people this question all the time because I think there's actually some humor in it. How many times have you ever heard sermons preached from the book of Ecclesiastes? I've preached a few. But... <laughs> right. <laughs> it, 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 probably Ecclesiastes 3.11 is the one that's used the most. It took, God has put eternity in the hearts of every man. Okay. And there's a few others in there uh, about the, time, the times and the seasons. That one thing, yes, exactly. All of a sudden, and everything turned, turned. You know Come on, so, Jennifer, throw your part yeah, in here. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, we're going back to the 70s now. Man. I was a rocker. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Jennifer's way too young. I was a punk that. rocker, though. Yeah, I don't know what kind of rocker Robin was. <laughs> Oh, Robin did everything that you would not mm -hmm. even believe. But uh, uh, so I, I began to read this book because I thought I, the Lord kept challenging me. Read this and understand. Read and understand. And I'm like, Lord, I don't get it. And then right in the very front, you, uh, Lonzine, I, I started reading about futility, vanity, all of these different things that that this man had tried to experience and tried to gather and tried to gain, tried to accumulate for himself, everything that he tried to do for himself. And then he said, it's all futile. It's wow. all vanity. It's all futile. And I realized this. The name Koheleth is literally in the Hebrew what that book is called. The Koheleth. Do you know what that word means in the Hebrew? One who gathers. It means one who gathers. And the Lord spoke this into my ear, Lonzine. This is the cry of Adam. It's the cry of my humanity. It's the cry of my people. Everything that they've ever tried to do, everything that they've ever tried to accomplish has produced nothing but disappointment, anxiety, fear of death, an earth-tethered, dwarfed existence. Never knowing, never finding anything that's going to fill that longing and desire of that deep hole inside of them. Never finding what it is that satisfies truly and brings an eternal revelation of the power of their existence and where they came from. And that's what led me. That's one of the things that started leading me on this journey because God told me then, I want you to define for my people who they are, where they came from, and what their purpose is. Uh, we've got about four minutes. Um, we have to end on time. <laughs> um, with it, I, I want to say thank you for you to you. You know, you pay you pay an interesting price. You you every every gift, every ascension gift does pay a price. But there are some that are willing to pay the highest price. And there are some that just want to do the mediocre thing, just do enough to get by. And I, I, I can see where your desire for people to know and to understand, it's so unselfish. You know, many will listen to the knowledge, one of you, I, I listen to, to Jennifer sometimes and and, um, you know, she's one that has a Jeremiah message or a Timothy message. Don't let anybody despise you because of you. you. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's but it's it's like when the brain does when we move past the natural intellect to the supernatural intellect, then that's always jaw dropping conversation. And you pay a price for that because I, I don't think that we can gather that kind of knowledge except by passion, by intimacy, by willingness. It's like you said, Jennifer, going out, the, the, the purpose is not to have the date with your spouse, of which I'm still, I'll, I'll share on that when it's my turn. Um, but it's the fact that you're spending time with the spouse. And it's not a thing of trying to brag on it to everybody about what God has shown you. It's about the fact that you've entered into that chamber, that bed chamber with him, and when you come out, it, it looks like you've been with God. 
So Apostle Robin, thank you for staying in the bedchamber. I want to go back to one more thing. I know I said that, but I, I'm going to cut it to this. You get up at three or so in the morning and you sit there before him. And I've had the privilege of being on your back porch. Is that one of the places or do you just sit at your kitchen table where you are right now? And when you listen to him, can you just give us a glimpse? You got uh, basically a minute and a half of what kind of things does he say to you? Does that sound right, Jennifer? Is that what we want to know? He always whispers things in my ear. At, at, at this point in my life, he, he whispers things in my ear for the purpose of sharing with others. His desire for my life is to reveal the desire of his heart to, to those who he has sent me to. I, I am an apostle of desire. That's what I am. I'm an apostle of desire. I'm a sent one by God to reveal to you the necessity and the, and the heartfelt love, dream, desire that he has to be with you. So everything that he ever whispers to me now is not just for me because he and I have such an intimate relationship, but he has sent me into the earth and kept me alive for the purpose of revealing to you how much he loves you and the kind of thoughts that he has toward you. And I, I can't find any other way that I could be in any way, if I can use the word successful at all, which I don't, that doesn't fit, but that's the only word I can think of. That the only way that I can measure any fruit or success that I have as an apostle is by the success that you have in your relationship with him. It's the only measuring stick I have. Wow. Thank you. I know. Mic drop. So y'all that are watching, this is where we ended it because otherwise it just opens. Thank you again, Apostle Robin Beach. And thank you, my beautiful sissy, Apostle Jennifer Foster. Yes, I love you too so much. We so love much. You. Let's do this again, y'all. And those of you that are enthusiastic about it, share the broadcast. Make sure that you reach out to him on um, Messenger. And remember, we don't just have conversations. We have kingdom conversations. Amen. Amen. Woo.